And thank you for joining us. My name is Ben Kilcoyne, and I'm the Communications Manager with Olive Group, the developers of the MC Squared platform. And it's great to have you with us. MC Squared is a platform where communities take training, view job opportunities, stay up to date with the latest industry news, build on personal talent with targeted programs, and communicate with others in the community who face the same challenges and opportunities as you. It's almost a year since everybody's lives were turned upside down by the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's been a year of difficulty for most people. We've all had to deal with new challenges. Many challenges though are old ones and our new ways of living mean that we have to learn how to cope in different ways. Uh, and dealing with emotional stress during the lockdown is a particularly difficult thing to do. This evening, we're going to be joined by Dr. Derek Smith, who will talk to us about his highly acclaimed program, Being There. Being There is a training program that is the culmination of 30 years of Dr. Smith's work as a practicing psychotherapist and teacher. In a nutshell, Being There provides training to professionals and lay people in basic and essential counseling skills. And Derek will talk to us about listening and the power of connection, which is so important at this time. Uh, before I introduce Derek, I'd just like to ask you, our audience, to submit any questions for the short Q&A session that we have planned for the end. This will give Derek the opportunity to answer any questions you may have. And you can do this by clicking the Q&A tab at the bottom of your webinar screen, or simply by leaving a comment on the YouTube page that you're watching from. Uh, please be aware that you will be on mute and this live session will be recorded. Okay, so once again, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Smith to the MC Squared series of webinars. Uh, Derek, over to you. So good. Good evening to everyone. I hope um, you can see me, uh, Ben. I'm yep. visible. I'm visible. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, please excuse me. My name is Derek Smith, and I am the presenter and writer of the Being There program. Uh, and thanks to Olive Media, who've done an amazing job making it available to everyone. And um, just a little bit about myself. I, I started here in Dublin, where I'm, I'm living at the moment, and I trained in Ireland uh, as a humanistic psychotherapist. And that had a, a profound effect on me in the sense that I always felt that the skills, many of the skills that in a sense seem to be exclusive to counselors and therapists could be and should be available to everyone so that we could all make that vi valuable difference. I went to America and um, studied there, did my PhD in psychology, became a director of a mental health center. And it was during that time I got the opportunity uh, to write the Being There program, which essentially is offering um, basic counseling skills to everyone. And it, it really took off there. And we started running, I started running workshops there uh, in hospitals and in other public centers. And people seemed to have um, taken to it and often at the end of a program, I'd be asking people, well, why did you take this program? And they, they would say, you know, since I've taken this program, I now have a relationship with my godson, or I remember a, a, a woman telling me that she was able to be present to her dad while he was dying. So in a very, that's just a little brief presentation of where I'm coming from, because I know our time this evening is very short. And what I want to try to do is to use every second of this time to offer you which, some practical skills, which I think you might find uh, supportive wherever you are, whether it's at home or if you're trying to communicate through Zoom or any other um, web. And um, I called it listening, the power of connection. And I'm just going to go on now to the slides for this evening and begin by explaining that very first slide, if I may. Um, so here we are at the very first slide. And as I said, I called it listing the power of connection. 
The reason I did that was that I've been following surveys in regard to what people find very supportive to get through the coronavirus. And it's a very, very difficult time for all of us. Each and every one of us are being affected. And I believe we're all being affected uh, psychologically at some level. So the number one resource that research has told us that is helping people to work through this isolation and lockdown is the power of connection. The number two would be holding on to your resilience. And what I offer people when I'm doing little workshops on Zoom is I say to them, don't allow yourself to be a victim of the coronavirus. But this afternoon, I'd like to just look at the listening because listening can have a profound effect on people. And you and I know that. Uh, if, if somebody is really listening to us, it's a great gift. And what I thought we might do tonight is with a few, few little tips, take the listening skill and bring it to the next level as we stay connected during the coronavirus. So if I were to begin with a, a little example, so for example, I'm just imagining a phone call and Michael rings Mary and he says, hello, Mary, Mike here. How are you doing at the moment? That would be an Irish phrase. Oh, it's very tough, replies Mary. Yes, you're, you're so right. I'm finding it very tough as well. So what's happening at the moment in your life? Ah, oh, sure, I'm trying to listen to the television or I'm doing a bit of reading or staying in touch with the children. Now, I'm going to stop there because if I rewind that little tape, when the phone call was made and he said, Mary, how's it going for you? And she said, it's very tough. If at that point he had said to her, you're finding it very tough, Mary would have said yes, and she would have given him more information. And if he or she who was listening kept just staying with Mary as she spoke, you're shifting the whole encounter into a different level. And that's what I hope we'll get from this evening's program. So I'm just going to begin now the next slide, which is Stephen Coveney. And I think it's very good because what he's telling us is that people tend to be hard of listening rather than hard of hearing. Hearing happens all the time. You and I are hearing noises. I'm hearing noises in the background of the heating noise. You're hearing noises probably wherever you are. And we're hearing noises, as I say, all the time, different noises. And sometimes, for instance, somebody might move in from a rural environment to a city. And they say, I couldn't sleep last night, the noise of the traffic. And if they're hearing this noise, but eventually after a week or so, they won't hear that noise anymore. They will have got used to it and it will no, no longer impact them. <clears throat> Sorry, so that is hearing. But listening is a totally different skill because listening means that you and I literally are making ourselves 100% available to the other person. And I think we've all been caught out. Somebody is speaking and we're letting on to listen and we're not listening. We can hear, we hear the person speaking and they look at us and they say, you weren't listening to me. And I say, oh, I was. And they say, well, tell me what I said. And I blush. So as I say, listening is a skill that you and I can learn. And it's a skill we can all learn. Listening is not a skill just for therapists and psychologists and counselors. Listening is a skill for everyone. So when we go into the whole area of listening, I'm going to begin with what is regarded as the four levels of communication. And in the four levels of communication, 
you can see on the screen cliche and judgment. And it is said that, believe it or not, most people spend their day between cliche and judgment. So what is cliche? Cliche is you're leaving your house for work, the neighbor is coming out and you say, hi, Mike, hi, Mary, and then you get into your car. If you had said, hi, Mike, and Mike said, oh God, I'm not feeling very well today, uh, I have a bit of a headache, you'd be saying, I didn't want to listen to any of that. I just wanted to say hi. And that's all we want from uh, the cliche. It's just basically, it's probably not even communication. To put it crudely, it's a dog sniffing a dog when they move on. That's cliche. Uh, there's no listening skill involved there whatsoever. And then the next area is judgment. And if you examine your day, you find that you spend, they, they suggest, by the way, most of our day between cliche and judgment. Judgment is, hey, Mike, were you watching the match last night? What did you make of it? Judgment. Mike, I got a very good takeaway. Uh, well worth giving them a call. Judgment. Mary, I saw a very interesting program on TV. What was it called? EastEnders. Well, what happened in the last thing? So that's all judging what happened. And we tend to dance between both of these forms of communication for most of our day. And we're not even to, into the listening level. So if we go a little bit deeper, we're now into feeling level. And feeling is when somebody says to you, perhaps, I'd be very nervous doing that. Now, one response could be, ah, go on out of that. But a, a feeling response would be, you'd be very nervous. And the person knows by your reply that you're feeling with them. And because they pick up that you're feeling with them, they go a little bit deeper with you. Yeah, I'd be really very nervous about doing that because the last time I tried this, I didn't succeed. Now they're sharing an emotional experience as much as, as information. And hopefully couples would at least get to that level in relationship. And tragically, sometimes couples lose that level and go back to cliche and judgment. And then things can become very difficult. The last form of communication is deep perception. And that basically means silence. You can see an elderly couple holding hands saying nothing. And you can see a young couple sitting on a bench saying nothing. And yet that's the deepest form of communication. Everything has been said. When silence speaks, all senses, all your senses are listening. When we're silent and listening, all our senses are involved. And that's where you and I need to go when we want to listen to the other person. One of the most recent contributions into the whole art of listening has come from neuroscience. And neuroscience has helped us to understand relationship and listening at a very, very profound level. And I just want to offer you two insights from neuroscience. One, when a baby is born, the brain develops not just by being fed, but by the relationship between the mother and the baby. That brain will physically grow. And neuroscience has discovered through that, that listening has a powerful effect on people. And if as a baby, the baby isn't fully attended to and the relationship isn't fully developed, when we grow up, the art of listening and fully listening can not only be I'm being heard, but it can be healing 
And research, believe it or not, has said it can also be curative. So that's the first thing, the power of relationship. Now, neuroscience has also told us that we just don't have a brain, but we have two brains, separate, not two halves of a whole, performing two different functions. And on the left brain here, you can see it's the analytic logical facts. And on the right side, we've got the creativity, arts, intuition, emotion, imagination, and feeling. So there are two brains, two, two brains, not the same, providing different functions. And we can actually grow almost living out of our left brain with little or no contact with the right brain. But once we're aware that we're not fully alive to our right brain, you and I can develop that brain. And there is where the work of listening is to be found. And of course, we'll always resort to the left brain. But we need very often, if not most of the time, sit in our right brain. And the danger, this is where the danger lies, that often we may think that's left brain stuff, that we're in the right brain when we're not. For example, oh, you're upset. Now, that might imply that I'm emotionally aware you're upset, but it could also imply that's a, I'm just making it, that's a thought, it's a summation. So it's very subtle, particularly when we want to understand emotions, as you and I will do a little bit later. So from the point of view of doing work and listening, right brain is very important. And it's, I do it myself. I often ask myself, well, am I my left brain or am I right brain? And I need to get to know my right brain much better. So I think there's a good uh, presentation, if you like, of the radical difference between a left and right brain. And you just look at the body language of the face there. You can see how different they are, how graphically different they are. And that's where the tongue is stuck out, is where we need to be in the listening mode. I just, I'm taking this in right now. Um, and I'm just asking you to read it alone because I know you don't want me to be reading everything. So hopefully you've had a chance to read that. And if we were together, we could have fun with this because I, I would be asking you, if you are reading that with your left brain, what do you feel or what do you think you might focus on? Well, the chances are you might say, well, sure, we can arrange extra classes for you. I know a teacher that's very good. If we're in our right brain, we realize that the person probably needs support and probably may need support in developing self-esteem and when they develop their self-esteem they will realize that they're competent to do their physics but they they will deal with the the more profound issue that sense of being less than and again i just invite you to have a look at this question, there's two questions here. Again, if you can just quietly read them. So the, the response to the first one, I would say, this is just me speaking, I would say yes, listening is always a conscious effort. It, it doesn't happen automatically. It's not something that we just have, or as I say, automatically, we have to be consciously attuned to the other. And I use a tuning fork. 
And when we're attuned, it's like we resonate with the person we're listening to. Is the response necessary? Well, we respond in so many different ways. If I was slouching on, 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 the, on my chair, I'd be giving an indication perhaps that I'm not really interested. If I talk to from the other side of a desk, I'm also giving an image of perhaps a power difference. If I take off my watch and put it aside, I'm communicating that what's happening now is very important. I may look at you in a way that communicates empathy. Uh, my body language and silence particularly can convey that I'm listening. So a response doesn't always have to be verbal. Uh, we respond, perhaps we're responding all the time, but we're not aware of it. And sometimes our bodies, by the way, as you know, because you and I have had the same experience, sometimes people's bodies betray what they say. Oh yeah, I was listening to you. And you know from their body language, they weren't. A few facts about listening. Um, and again, I'll just leave it there for a moment or two. Okay, I, I hope you managed to read at all. And I just want to, if I may just focus on a few little things. 80% of the time we don't remember what we hear. But it, actually, if you really listen to another person, you will remember what they say. Um, if we truly listen, we won't become distracted. We'll become absorbed in the other person. There's a phrase, it's called surrender to contact. And when I was training, I found it a very helpful way of meeting another person. Surrender to contact means that I forget myself. So I'm not thinking of me, but I'm fully listening to you. I surrender to what you're saying and allow you like as if I'm a container to flow through me. And then I will respond as well as I can. And the other thing is that, as you can see, we think so fast and people can speak so fast that if you are listening, sometimes people can speak to so fast that it might be necessary to say, if you, if you wouldn't mind just for a moment, I'd like to recap. You know, you were saying that your, your father died and that you were very upset because he died alone and the police discovered it three days later. So in other words, you give yourself time. Don't, don't try to catch up with people who are flying along at a million miles an hour. You can just ask them to, to pause for a moment. Now, when it comes to listening, I'm really offering you what I would consider for my, if you like, experience, what is essentially important, but also trust me when I say this to you, it's going to make your life very, very easy. It's going to take the difficulties out of the, of the challenge. I, I say be a, becoming a scuba diver because years ago I trained to be, be a scuba diver and I discovered that when you learn to be a scuba diver, most of the training is about if you're 100 feet below, below the surface, something goes wrong, as it happened to me. And this giant, huge eel frightened the life out of me. And I wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible. But if I had gone straight to the surface from 100 feet, I could do damage to my lungs. So the natural flight tendency, let's get the hell out of there. I had to resist that with all my might and slowly, slowly surfaced uh, and just keeping my fear at bay. 
And it's the same thing with listening. What comes natural to us, we have to keep out of the way. So what do I mean? Most of the time when somebody wants you to listen to them, they would like you to fix it for them, to give them an answer, to tell them what to do, to find an escape route, to find a solution. And you're not there to fix any. So that, in a sense, might give you a bit of freedom. And even if you were to fix it and it went wrong, who are they going to blame? So that's the first thing. So what comes natural isn't in the art of listening. The second thing is keeping our own agenda out. I might like to, uh, for the person to uh, have it all worked out. I might like that they go and talk to their mother. I might like many things for that person, but that's my agenda. What I want for you may not be what you need for you. So I have to keep my own agenda out because sometimes you see what happens is somebody has an experience similar to yours. They might've had a crash in a car and you immediately go back to that moment in your life and you start speaking from there, but that's your agenda. That's your agenda, so you have to keep that out. The next tip is labeling is disabling. And that really means when people start saying, oh, you're a warrior, oh, you work too much, oh, you, you panic too much. When we label people, we disable them. And the last one, do you remember one of the early slides I, I was saying, cliche judgment. We live in the world of judgment, happening all the time. And one of the reasons people keep their skeletons in the cupboards or presses, they're afraid of being judged. And trust me, if you sit with non-judgment, no matter what the person says, it will be very healing for them. He didn't judge me. That can be a very powerful experience for somebody in a world where we tend to be very quick to judge. Now, here's a very practical suggestion. And you might be surprised when I throw it up there. Never ask a why question. We spend all our time asking why questions. Why did you do that? Why were you there? Why didn't you go home on time? Why didn't you get the bus? Why didn't you? Why, why, why? When you ask a why question, or when I ask a why question, I put the other person in a defensive posture because why always implies a judgment and it's not a positive judgment. Why did you do that? If you can hear me asking the question, can you feel the judgment yourself just now? Why did you do that? So forget why. Never, never, never use why. If you ask a small child, why did, did you do that? That's the end of the conversation. They say, that's why. End of. So you might say, Derek, well, what do I do instead of asking a why question? Every time you're asked, you want to ask a why question. If you say to somebody, well, can, can you tell me more about that? In other words, you can reframe the question so that it's no longer a judgment question. And if you say to somebody, can you tell me more about it? If you, to a little child, if you, instead of saying, well, why did you? Well, can you tell me more about what happened in school today? It invites the person to go deeper. So now we have what's called the five pillars of being able to sit with somebody in a listening way. And the first one I've sort of made reference to when I was talking to you about the right and the left brains. We need to be able to identify a person's thoughts and their feelings. Sometimes 
I sit with clients all the time and I say, what are you feeling? And they say, fine. But fine isn't a feeling. And so it's important that we don't confuse thoughts or people using our left brain and saying, you know, I was tired last night. And, and can you say, how did that, what does that feel like? You see? And if it's a thought, then they might look at you. I, I just want, I'm wondering, what, what does that feel like for you? It's very important because many people are not in touch with what they're feeling. And if we're not in touch with what we're feeling, that can be a power within us that we're not aware of. Empathy. Empathy means, and we have a little video, I think maybe in the next session. Empathy means that I feel what you're feeling. If you walk a mile in my shoes, then you can speak for me, says the Native American Indian. But empathy is not just that. Empathy is I'm feeling what you're feeling and you come back and say, that's exactly how I feel. Because if you don't give me feedback, it's not empathy. Because I could be feeling, I'll give you a good example. Um, let's say a wife, husband died comes and sits with me and I'm, I'm saying, oh, this lady must feel very sad. And I'm saying, oh, you must feel very sad. That's me, it's nothing to do with her. And then she says, no, I'm very angry. He left me six years ago. So do you see where we need to be in touch with ourselves all the time, mindful as I sit with another person that I'm not bringing my own personal agenda into the equation. Having a capacity for being spontaneous and genuineness means we're not playing games with people. We're not trying to be the expert on somebody's life. Carl Rogers, the founder of person-centered therapy, once said, a person is the expert in their own lives. And I think it's a beautiful phrase. And I believe it. A person is the expert in their own lives. And if you can provide the framework, that's it, just the framework, so that they can connect with their own story, they will discover with you the next step. And that is so important. So a non-threatening, safe, and non-possessive environment means that you, when you sit with somebody and you're going to listen to them, you're not there to be their friend, to be their comforter. Ah, you'll be all right. Don't worry about that. That's, this is not the place for that. That's not supportive. And the danger is that it sometimes happy, happens that a person becomes too friendly, too, too nice, and the person who's come for support feels, oh, I couldn't say that to Mary, she's so nice, I'd upset her. So we can't uh, get involved in a friendly uh, and in, in a way that undo, it, it undoes the work of listening. And the non-possessive environment is very important because somebody, let's say somebody says to Derek here, oh, thank you very, very much. I, you really were very helpful and you really sorted out my problems and I'm very grateful to you. Well, I'd ask myself, what was I doing? Because I would like to hear the person say, I'm very grateful maybe because you allowed me to discover what I needed to do for myself. You gave me the space that I could work out my next step. And that's where the art of listening is. Unconditional positive regard means that no matter what the person has done, I sit with unconditional positive regard for you. Without judgment, I take you totally as, as the person in front of me. And that comes from what Carl Rogers says, that when we were growing up as small children, 
often a parent would say to the little boy, oh, thank you for getting my slippers. Or to the young girl, thank you for getting my paper. Thank you for making my tea. Thank you for this. And so the child begins to think they're good only in so far as they do something good. Whereas unconditional positive car means you are good because you're you, not because of what you do. And when somebody experiences unconditional positive regard, it has a profound impact on that person. And now we're just going to have a little video for a moment. And I have to stop sharing here. I have to stop my thing. Sorry, I have to stop my what? I hope Cal of you can take over. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Sorry, Derek, just to let you know, you need to unmute your microphone now. Thank you. And I need to get back, do I? I do, yeah. Back to me. Back to entire screen. Uh, sorry about this little delay. Um, and that seems to be me, hopefully. And we're back here to this uh, slide here. Sorry, uh, back to that slide. So we just have two more slides and my little presentation is over. So all I'm taking from this is simply one of the great gifts I was given in my training was when I was seeing my first client, I was trying to remember all the theory and all the group therapy and all the practice. How could I remember it all? And the professor said, sit in the unknown. 
And what he meant by that was, you don't need to know. The person who comes will tell you what you need to know. So if you're sitting with a friend or you're sitting in your job, the skill is simply to sit there and say, you're very welcome. And I'm just, if you'd like to just to say what it is that, you know, brought you here, for example. And, and somebody might say, well, I'm really, really very upset today. And, and could you say, what is it that's causing you upset? Yeah, uh, a very close friend of mine died. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And would you like to say a little bit more about your close friend? And you take the lead all the time. You just listen and take the lead. So you sit in the unknown. You have no idea where you're going to go, but you're listening and then you, you pick up the, the key phrase or mood, if it's a feeling, and you continue with that. And that really makes it much, I hate to use the word easier, but it, it, it will help you to have confidence in, in working and supporting other people. The last slide, um, might as well go from this one here. The last slide in the presentation is this one. And this again is from Stephen Coveney. If you choose to be a skilled active listener, there are three important guidelines to employ when it's your turn to speak. Speak only in order to reflect back. What that means is simply this, is don't start talking for the sake of talking. Only speak when you feel and believe that you're responding to what the other person has said. And if you're not quite sure, you could say, I'm just aware you said that you're having a difficult time in your relationship, reflecting back. Objectively receive. Now that simply means that you don't bring yourself into it, that you're not bringing your feelings or your attitudes or, or your beliefs into the situation. You're like a neutral container, allowing yourself to receive what's being said and you're allowing yourself to respond appropriately. And above all, so that the person knows they're being heard. So when you say it sounds like uh, you're about to change jobs, that's exactly it. Um, when you make communicate that they're heard is very important. Otherwise, pe the person will, will might be saying, I wondered, has he heard what I said? So reflect back, be objective, and communicate to the person that they're heard. I can see it sounds like you're sad right now, communicating back. So I hope some of these practical skills will encourage you to take the next step in the power of communication. And can I thank you all very much? And I hand you back to Ben. Hi, Derek. That's great. Thanks very much. That's a really fascinating insight into the uh, power of listening. Um, so we've actually got a few questions in from viewers. Um, if you're ready, uh, we'll go with the first one there. That's uh, during the pandemic, what do you feel are the most common mental health challenges affecting people? And does this program address any of these issues? I, th I think, Ben, thanks for the question. I think, I think uh, people are affected in many different ways. But again, if we were to go on research, they would say people are more fearful, they're more anxious, and people, some people are finding it, um, they're depressed. And what the coronavirus has shown to us, that it's true connection, it's true connection, it's, we get through this together. And the Being There program allows people, whoever's listening, to bring it to the next stage where you can really make a difference in a person's life, where you can uh, help them to relax, help them to, I'll give you a very simple example. Um, very often people are not quite sure uh, wh what's happening to them emotionally. And if I'm living alone, and I'm sort of feeling upset. 
and I'm having feelings like I'm feeling down and I don't understand my feelings and I talk to you Ben and you stay with me I then say thank God, God I thought I was going crazy you have normalized my situation and I use the word normalized because people are not they, they don't realize that you can have these emotions we are all having them and that normalizing is a huge gift to another human being and so yeah I would say I would like to think that as we maybe change as a result of the coronavirus in terms of being there for each other that the this little program might make some small contribution great thanks um okay so the second question I have there is that uh what, in your experience, are the main barriers to people being there for one another? Well, I think there are a number. I think, sadly, I think that because uh, counselling and therapy has been made available, that what the, the negative side of that is that people don't realise that they can be of incredible support to their neighbour or to their friends with just a little skill. Carl Rogers, the founder of person-centered therapy, a, a very big school of therapy, believed in a matter of a short time, he could equip the average person with the essential skills to be an excellent counselor. That's the first thing. The second thing, Ben, is that, and if, to anybody listening to me, that we've all had experiences of knocking at the door of somebody else and I think we've all had the experience where we felt judged we could even have felt humiliated and that would deter people from uh, saying well I'd like to be able there to listen to somebody else but you may also have had the experience of sitting with somebody and it's I'm not talking about a therapist now or a doctor I'm talking to um, a good friend of yours and you realize through listening to them because they were helpful to you Gosh, I'd love to do that. And I know there are many people who would say, I'd love to do that. And I'm saying to you tonight, if you're one of those people, do it like the Nike ad. Okay, good advice. Um, what, are, what are the long-term benefits of taking this course? I'll tell you what the long-term benefits, benefits are, Ben, is first of all, it's not just about the other person. Uh, I, I believe this course will enrich me as Derek as a human being. It will help me to understand myself better. It will help me to relate better to other people. It will help me to avoid pitfalls where I can find myself, let's say, for instance, uh, losing self-esteem. Um, I would say that uh, if you take the program, I guarantee you, you will be personally enriched and you'll certainly be far more effective uh, with people that you would like to support and enrich and I'm saying this with with 100% honesty when I would ask people who took the course with me what was the effect most people would say to me Derek uh, I was able to be there for another person I was in hospital and I saw this woman I sat beside her uh, I now have a, a different relationship with some of my staff. I, I now have a better relationship with my patients. Um, quintessentially, people have found it, that it enriched not only them, but their relationships with other people. Okay, um, another one is, uh, can this type of training help me at work? Oh, I would say absolutely. I would just say, uh, if you were to take the Being There program offered by Olive Media, absolutely, because it's going to do a few things for you. It's going to give you, certainly it's going to enrich your self-confidence. Certainly it's going to enrich your communication skills. Certainly it's going to enrich your listening skills. And I guarantee you, if, if you are, are perceived as a good listener, as somebody that another person can, can talk to and be with, that will have a profound effect in your overall relationships in the workplace. And particularly if you're in the workplace and you have an overseeing responsibilities to some members of staff, absolutely, absolutely. Because um, if I was to say one thing, hands up, 
I learned when I started off this course that I thought I had the skills of being a good listener and I realized the skills I thought I needed were precisely the opposite, like fixing and telling people what to do. And, you know, Asher, you'll be all right. Uh, and this question, it's the last question, seems very appropriate. Can listening, active listening, like you uh, tell us, can, is it, will it work on Zoom and other video chats? I mean, is it the same concept and will it apply even on video conferencing? Okay. <laughs> I'll begin with a personal experience. I have to see my therapist on Zoom. So, so I have to say yes. I have to see my super, believe it or not, in, in, in training as therapists, even though you're fully trained and you've got your degrees, etc., you still have to be a supervision. So I, I, I see my supervisor and absolutely I, she's listening to me. I'm listening to her. I see my clients through Zoom, absolutely we can relate to each other. And I actually sort of have connections from my time in, the, in America. And I still stay connected through WhatsApp or Zoom. And I can, I, yeah, you can absolutely, absolutely. That's great, okay. Well, um, I think that's it. Uh, unless there's anything else you'd like to add, Derek. No, I, I just thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And I, if, if, to those who have joined, I hope that you are, are encouraged to uh, just just go for it. That's great. Thanks a million. And um, I'd like to end this session by saying thanks everybody for logging on and participating and that we really appreciate your support. And uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, myacademy.com. Um, and also I'd like to thank our production team for their work in bringing this live stream uh, to you. I'm just going to uh, mute the call because, or mute the Derek's audio because I think we've just been having a little bit of uh, an audio issue there. Um, but at the end of the stream, actually, more details will be available on screen on how to access the Being There program. So if you're interested, please don't log off until you've viewed and follow the instructions. Um, further details will also be made available by email to anybody watching. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Smith for being with us uh, this evening. Once again, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you and goodbye.